Aloha, Talofa, Hafade. Welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, we're excited to have you at this special joint webinar with Pacific Risk and Pacific Fire Exchange. The webinar today is called Changing Climate and Wildfire in Hawaii. Uh, my name is Elliot Parsons. I'm a specialist with Pacific Risk, and I'll be handing over the mic in just a, a second to Nani Barreto, my co-host, who is co-executive director of the Hawaii Wildfire Management Organization. Um, I'd like to do a, a little housekeeping before we get started. Um, uh, first of all, if you could all introduce yourselves in the chat, uh, let us know your name and affiliation, where you're calling in from, so we can get a sense of who is joining us. Um, also, I think everyone has turned your uh, mics and cameras off if you're not presenting, so thanks for keeping those off, but um, when we get to the questions and answers at the end, feel free to turn them on. Um, we are recording this presentation to make it available uh, to our partners and anyone who missed it afterwards. Um, so wanted to give you a heads up about that. Um, if at any point you think of questions during the presentation uh, at any time, please um, put those in the chat um, so that we don't forget and we'll get to those questions at the end. Uh, finally, we'll be sharing a survey uh, at the end of the presentations and when we finish and uh, would like to invite everyone to fill it out to let us know what we did well, what we can improve upon, and what webinars you might be interested in seeing in the future. So a little bit about our organizations uh, before we get started on the presentations. Um, for Pacific Risk, the Pacific Regional Invasive Species and Climate Change Management Network is a multi-partner collaboration across Hawaii and the U.S. affiliated Pacific Islands dedicated to understanding the interactions between invasive species and climate change in the Pacific in order to improve management strategies to address these combined <clears throat> and interacting threats. We seek to create a space for engagement and the communication of lessons learned, as well as promote relevant research tools and strategies for effectively addressing invasive species in the face of climate change. And I'd like to hand over to Nani. Thanks, Elliot. Hi, everyone. I'm like Elliot said, I am Nani Barreto, and I am with the Hawaii Wildfire Management Organization. We partner closely with the University of Hawaii on a joint wildfire science communication program called the Pacific Fire Exchange. Um, our program mainly focuses on addressing wildfire science, uh, communication gaps across Hawaii, all the way into the Western Pacific, um, and translating that science into action for purposes of really improving our wildfire outcomes. We do a lot of webinars um, like this one, where we invite local experts to speak on uh, wildfire science tools, technologies, new research, um, including today's talk about wildfires in a changing climate. And I just wanna recognize um, we have a really good lineup today. And I wanna thank them all in advance for being here. And I just checked the, um, the participation list and we're going beyond 30. So it's great to have everybody on the line today. I'll hand it back to you, Elliot. Thanks so much, Nani. Um, yeah, great to see everyone. It looks like folks are still adding into the call. Um, I'd like to introduce our three speakers for today. Um, uh, so first of all, uh, Mike Walker is the state firewide fire protection forester for the department, the Hawaii Department of Land and Natural Resources, Division of Forestry and Wildlife. Michael has 23 years of experience in conservation in Hawaii and resides on Oahu. And his talk is current wildfire conditions, observations, and suppression efforts. Um, following Mike, um, Dr. Clay Traurnicht is an extension specialist in the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Management at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. His program focuses on wildland fire and ecosystem protection, taking science from development to translation and practice in support of watershed workers in Hawaii and Micronesia. His program information and outputs are found at the pacificfireexchange.org and ecosystemswork.org. And he will be presenting on the intersection of climate change and wildfire in Hawaii. And we'll be sharing a, a link to a fact sheet that was produced 
uh, on this topic. Um, and then um, the third presentation will be Emma Ewan, who is the manager of the Native Ecosystems Program of the Hawaii Division of Forestry and Wildlife, Department of Land and Natural Resources. She leads the department's top priority initiative to protect Hawaii's source of water forests. Emma grew up in Hamakua on Hawaii Island and graduated from Hilo High School. She received a bachelor's degree in public policy of the environment and natural resources and a master's degree in sociology from Stanford University. She's received various awards for her leadership and service, including the EPA uh, Region 9 Environmental Achievement Award. And she will be presenting values at risk and implications for management. Um, after that, we'll do a, a couple minutes of summary uh, and then go into Q and A. Um, well, thanks again for joining us. And with that, I would like to hand the mic over to Mike Walker. All right. Anoa'i Miki Aloha. I am Mike Walker, as Elliot said, uh, from the Division of Forestry and Wildlife, Department of Land and Natural Resources. So just a brief um, kind of background on fire in Hawaii. Um, Hawaii is very unique in a lot of ways, as, as most of you know, but one of uh, the uh, uniquenesses of the ecosystem that we have here is that it's not really, uh, fire is not a dominant driver in ecosystem evolution in Hawaii. And um, prior to human settlement, there wasn't really uh, frequent fires much at all, limited to areas of volcanic activity and rare lightning strikes. And as you know, uh, hot spots can be around for a few thousand years, but the island of Kauai is 6.5 million years old. So there's lots and lots of time for plants and animals to evolve without fire as an influence on them. And that's how uh, makes the uh, our ecosystems here uh, somewhat unique in the world as well. Um, Kanaka Maoli were the first to use fire in the Hawaiian Islands, uh, mainly for agricultural land clearing and intentional burning to maintain such things as uh, peely grasslands, which were primarily used for uh, the thatching of roof. Uh, in the 19th century, with uh, Westerners uh, becoming coming to the state, or coming, sorry, coming to the island chain, uh, there was a rapid evolution in ecosystem change, and a, a large swaths of forests were cleared. One for uh, the collection and sale of sandalwood, and uh, also uh, ungulates were introduced as well, and a kapu was placed on them for a long period of time, and. Um, both fire being used to clear forest ecosystems and ungulates moving into those ecosystems uh, rapidly changed uh, the landscape that we have uh, until uh, plantation agricultural days started to um, become sort of dominant upon the landscape in the mid to late 19th century. And fire was used to, as a tool to, for sugarcane harvest and land prep as well. And plantation, agricultural, and ranching sort of dominated the landscape uh, for uh, well over 100 years. In, uh, and you can see here, this, this is a graph of in 1980, green is uh, predominant pasture land. Uh, that hot pink purple color is sugarcane um, and throughout from starting in the 1960s large-scale agricultural and ranching started to decline all the way up until this day where uh, as you know the most profitable thing a farmer can farm in Hawaii is a house or houses so um, by 2017 you can see nearly all of the sugarcane is gone. There's a still a reduction of pasture land across the state. Um, and so you go from large swaths of sugar and pineapple to large swaths of guinea grass on um, 
lands formerly used for agriculture, as well as some of these lands being developed into housing developments. Uh, but right adjacent to them is, you know, former develop, uh, agriculture land that's now fallow and has been taken over by guinea grass. So guinea grass uh, can grow six inches a day in optimal conditions, and it can throw 20 foot flame lengths. And so that sort of created the situation that we are in today, the, the decline of large scale agriculture, the development of rural landscapes across the state. Um, you can see right around the 60s, things start to get a little bit hotter and continue on to 2021, 2022, 2023. Um, and we we're, we're starting to have a uh, higher frequency of fires and larger fires burn on the landscape. So currently um, we're, we're doing all right in terms of uh, fire danger situation. Um, you can see that Maui is really the only thing that has any sort of abnormally dry conditions for this time of year, other than you know a tiny little patch of uh, leeward Hawaii Island and Northeast Hawaii Island there. We've had a fair amount of rain uh, from since January through April, um, and the majority of the island is relatively uh, islands are relatively green even on the leeward sides right now. We're not quite at the highest levels that we've ever had of rain, but we're we're far from the lowest. We're right around average right now, slightly above average, which is really good. Um, so rainfall forecast. Uh, this forecast says that we're going to be about 25% chance that, that we're going to be a little bit greater. Um, these, these are sort of the, just the, the, the forecast predictions for three parts of the state. Uh, for rainfall through May. Um, but as you folks may have heard uh, in the news that uh, La Nina is, is uh, coming to an end here and we're approaching the ENSO neutral uh, conditions here in the Pacific. And uh, some folks say that we're actually gonna be trans rapidly transferring into an El Nino by late summer, early fall. Uh, and so that's a dramatic shift in the uh, temperature regime across the Pacific, over the waters of the Pacific, and it's kind of a flip-flopping of it, where normally the eastern Pacific is relatively cool and dry. Um, those waters are going to be uh, heating up as we move into El Nino, and that has all sorts of climate impacts. Uh, most Folks are really familiar more with warmer waters equals more uh, tropical cyclones and such. And so that's one of the things, but um, I've got a little bit of a graph here sort of detailing things that can happen here in Hawaii as a result of an El Nino. So um, while rainfall tends to be above average in an El Nino year, uh, as you trend out of it, there can be a rapid, uh, shift towards a, a drying along with warmer temperatures, uh, particularly in the first half of the year after the El Nino. So what we could be expect we could be seeing is lots of green up, lots of fuels growing and growing and growing. You know, like I said, six inches a day under optimal conditions for guinea grass. And so if you you have a wet winter and you have a relatively wet summer where the fuels stay alive and continue to grow. And then you have another wet winter again, and the fuels continue. And then you have a drying trend after that. That's when you have a, a large amount of fuel buildup really on the landscape that can be extremely flammable. Um, drought conditions can persist post uh, El Nino um, and wildfire increases. Um, We can't really say that this is going to be a driver of a high fire season because 99% of the ignitions that we have here in the state are uh, human caused, whether they be accidental or on purpose, uh, or you know it's a you know mechanical error error and and somebody operating machinery on the landscape. So it's 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 kind of a hit and miss whether or not we're actually going to have a high fire season or not. But but 
the buildup of fuel it can uh, lead to dangerous conditions once it starts to dry out. Um, temperatures are going to be expected to climb as we move into uh, the El Nino year, or sometimes El Ninos can last longer than that uh, year, but, um, and uh, enhanced probabilities for below normal precipitation uh, can start to happen in the in this summer though it's you know it's it, it it varies from model to model so next part i'm going to talk about really is uh, rather than just talk about fire suppression in general where i'm going to talk about dofa's kind of wildland fire preparedness what what we do to uh, be ready maintain our readiness for fire and what how we actually also try to prevent fire and do some things prior to uh fire occurring that can uh one improve firefighter safety and to lessen the impact on our watersheds and our communities at large so uh we we like triangles in the fire community and i like to have a has clay as laughing at me uh, I, I like to talk about things in prevention, pre-suppression, and suppression efforts. So on the prevention side of things, uh, we do a fair amount of outreach, with, uh, in particular with Hawaii Wildfire Management Organization. They, um, they are a huge part of our uh, prevention outreach efforts. Um, they collaborate on uh, events with us. They produce radio ads. Uh, they have a website. We have a website. We produce content on our website. You can see here we have some Smoky Bear videos that we have specifically tailored for Hawaii. We have the wildfire drought lookout campaign that we do at the uh, beginning of every drought and beginning of every fire season. We have a press conference with our uh, county fire department cooperators. And um, they also have uh, been training folks in the National Fire Prevention uh, Prevention Association, NFPA's uh, home ignition zone uh, assessment training, where folks are going to folks that live in the wildland urban interface and looking at their homes and assessing the potential for ignition uh, as their home is currently, and also um, steps that they can take to uh, improve their safety around the home. Uh, moving on to pre-suppression, we have a militia staff, a militia force type staff. That means everybody has their own day job of forester, wildlife biologist, uh, et cetera. And then when we get a call that there's a fire, we switch hats and we become firefighters. So. We refresh everyone that's trained annually uh, in the spring, and we hold trainings, additional trainings as they're available with our uh, cooperators at the US Forest Service and the county fire departments. We also maintain our fire cache um, that includes maintaining all of our equipment and um, buying new equipment as we can uh, with the blessing of the legislature. Um, Another part of the pre-suppression effort that we do is a lot of planning. So we, again, work with Hawaii Wildfire Management Organization on community wildfire protection plans. These plans are uh, take, take the input of the community members as well as our cooperators at the county fire departments uh, and land, large land uh, managers and large land owners. And we, we do a bunch of an assessments of fire risk and danger to communities, what their values at risk are. And uh, also we come up with some action items as well, uh, projects and things that could happen to reduce the risk of fire on the landscape. And uh, these, these plans are used to apply for funding uh, through the US Forest Service Wildland Urban Interface Grant Program, as well as the Community Wildfire Defense Grant Program. Um, if anybody has any questions about those, you folks can ask me in the uh, chat. Um, they're a great resource for uh, improving uh, your community's safety. Uh, 
this is a map of all the ones that we have around the uh, state. It's a little bit old. We're working on the East Honolulu one right now. Uh, North Shore one was added in 2020. And uh, Kahikinui is finalized, as well as there's another South Maui one as well that's been completed. And the other part of pre suppression efforts that we do are fire breaks, fuel breaks, and uh, fuel reduction projects. We maintain about 142 miles of, of fire breaks. Uh, we're looking to expand that network. Uh, you can see some examples here. Uh, on the one in the lower right is around the community of Puako on Hawaii Island. The one in the middle there is Waikoloa Village. That fire break was put in right before a fire that uh, really did uh, allow firefighters access to suppress the fire and um, save the community there. And then uh, on the upper right there, uh, it's not just about using bulldozers to cut lines uh, around places. You can also use animals. Uh, grazing to reduce blazing is a um, nice catchphrase for sort of pulse grazing efforts that you know, we, we have these animals on the landscape and using them as a tool to um, reduce the fuels is, is uh, something that uh, we're looking to further expand upon. And a, a lot of fuel reduction efforts going on in Puvava area using cattle. And um, Elliot can answer any questions on that since that was his former job. Uh, and then finally, it's uh, putting the wet stuff on the red stuff. So we are the primary responder for 26% of the lands in the state. Um, example of a response map here is on the right. Um, anywhere you, where you see green is DOFO's uh, lands. And we are the primary responder for fires on those lands. And then we co-respond with the county fire department and our federal partners for an additional 32%. So anywhere in the pink and the white, and the blue are uh, areas that we also respond to as well. Um, the areas in red on that map are uh, active military firing ranges with unexploded ordnance that are no-go zones for us. So, And that's it. Um, I can answer questions at the end of the chat. And um, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Mike. Great to hear about um, all of these different tools and efforts out there, especially as we get into the dry season and potentially an El Nino. Um, Clay, I'm going to hand it over to you next. Thanks. Yeah, I uh, well, I think Mike gave an awesome background about like where fires kind of <laughs> come and where, where we are now. And so what I wanted to do was talk about this um, a bit of the research behind uh, trying to figure out like when and where fire risk is high. Um, and so let me just share screen here. It's kind of debating whether to do slides at all, but I'm, I'm going to do it. Um, so can you all see that? Okay. Are you seeing not presenter mode? I hope. Yeah, we got it. All right. So this is what I'm going to go over. Nani, if you could, I don't know if you've already done it, but just this, we recently put this fact sheet together, uh, Pacific Fire Exchange fact sheet. So I'm going to kind of go over a little bit of the guts behind this. And we sort of decided to get this out because I've been basically dragging my butt, like kind of publishing this, but this is based on a, some work that I had done a couple of years ago, just looking at the big island and trying to assess like uh, using kind of these basic fundamental drivers that Mike's been talking about uh, with fire, exploring alternative ways to map fire risk uh, and, and that allow us then to look at fire risk in the future and in the past and sort of like what rainfall does and what fuels do essentially uh, in terms of like how fire risk changes in space and time uh, across the islands. And with the end goal being um, we would help predict when risk is high and uh, sort of uh, anticipate when risk is high. And so, you know, Mike showed you that cool graph, which I actually had in this, and then I got rid of because he showed it. But like, you know, we're running off this cliff kind of in the past few decades where we see this huge increase in um, uh, area burned, annual area burned. Uh, and that's pretty much due to a uh, decline in, in, in agricultural land use, right? So this whole idea of like grass fire cycles and like, oh yeah, sort of there's a positive feedback between these grasslands and fires but like the reason why I have so much grass and we've got about um, a million acres of grass in the state 
is because uh, of this change in land use, right? So it's kind of like we've abandoned agriculture and all these fuels are kind of giving us problems. And then of course we know based on where we live and where we work that fires don't happen everywhere. Um, they tend to be in these leeward areas, uh, you know, the drier sides of the islands um, and in these kind of lowland non-native grass dominated areas, so these kind of grasslands and shrublands. Um, and, you know, it's not to say that they don't happen on the wet side. So I kind of have to remind us uh, just to always my, remind myself to always say that they, they do happen uh, uh, in windward areas. So we do have drought that affects, you know, in, the entire landscape. Um, and so, but what I'm talking about today is how do we use that, right? So we can kind of see the extent in this graph here. It's all this, this green and then the purple is kind of forest. So how do these fuels contribute to it? And how does the variability in rainfall that Mike's been talking about um, affect this fire risk? And it's really hard for Hawaii. There's been some attempts in the past. Here's a couple examples by the Forest Service. Um, and this, this work goes back into the 70s. Um, they're trying to figure out how do we predict fire risk. And, and why it's so hard is because these models that have been developed uh, for continental U.S., and they are working with different fuel types, so completely different vegetation types. Um, and they're all based on these sort of underlying assumptions, these really complex um, fire spread models, which make assumptions about how those fuel types behave given a certain set of weather conditions. And what we find, or what others have found when they try to apply this, this is um, the Poli Poli fire on Maui, I think it was 2007 or eight. Um, you know, here's the actual observed perimeter is that yellow. And when they ran their fire site, this fire model, using those assumptions, you can see it just kind of blows out of the, of the perimeter. And similarly, um, another attempt, here's this at Apokaloa training area, all these kind of like blurry blobs, hard to see, are the predicted fires, like how, where they think fire would be most frequent. And then these sort of gray, more sort of discrete uh, polygons are the actual fires. So you can see that there's a lot of mismatch there, right? And so uh, some other folks in the Forest Service kind of actually propose an alternative, which is using fire probability. Um, and so that's what I'm gonna kind of talk about, like how can we use another, another way of doing that? And what that's really fundamentally based on is that, um, you know, fires are unique uh, across the Pacific based on these different fuel types, based on how our fuels respond to weather, right? So how, the, how much rain we've gotten over the past 12 months versus how much rain we've gotten over the past couple months. And of course, all of this is driven by human caused ignitions, but we can use these fundamental drivers to basically figure out, you know, uh, and then historical fires to understand what were these conditions like at the time of the fire. And that's basically what I've been working on. And so I was kind of debating how much into the, into the guts of this I wanted to go, but essentially what, we're, what I'm building is a fire probability model. And the way I do it is just say, all right, here's our landscape. This is uh, an example from the corner, like kind of Northwest corner of the big Island. You just throw down a bunch of random points. And for all of those points, you say, did they burn or did they not burn? Like, it's pretty simple. So you load the points and this is every year I'm doing this. Um, you throw down the fire polygons and you classify each one of those points. Did you burn or not? And from that, you can sort of say that gives you a, the ability to fit a probability model, like a likelihood model. Um, and then at the same time, for all those points, you get these predictors, right? And so the ones I'm kind of be talking about today are, are annual woody and herbaceous cover. So kind of thinking about that green and purple map. So what's the fuel, dominant fuel at each location? And then the rainfall. And these I you can divide into short term, so like one to three month rainfall and long term rainfall. Um, the 12 month rainfall. And, and the reason for that is because we need to think about Hawaii, not in the context of temperate continental systems, but in the context of tropical savannas. Basically that's what we're dealing with here, right? It's, it's tropical savannas. And what savannas do <laughs> is they grow really quickly, right? Savannas are dominated by grasslands and they grow incredibly quickly in response to rainfall. So we're getting the cyclical accumulation of fuel. So all that low fire risk that we're dealing with like right at this moment and the green up that we're seeing all across the leeward sides, what that means is that we're like accumulating fuel. Uh, fuel. So we need to accommodate that long-term as well as the short-term kind of drying out, which is definitely the more intuitive uh, effect on fire risk, right, under drought. So we've got these sort of, sort of Temporally, like sort of short, uh, kind of they're specific in time. The, the monthly rainfall, we can use monthly rainfall and we can use annual land cover, which basically just accounts for the, like the effect of prior fires, for example. We don't have to worry about that. Um, and then these sort of longer term factors, which is, uh, oh, I skipped that. 
mean annual temperature, uh, soil moisture, three in there, um, and also ignition density, which is just like how frequent are these ignitions happening across the landscape, like these fire starts. Um, and that's a whole other sort of data set. And then if anyone's really interested, you can ask me questions about this, but the type of model we use allows us to fit relationships with each of these variables. And so when we actually look at this model prediction, in the context of an actual fire event, this is actually the fire that Mike was talking about that burned right up to the edge of Waikolo Village, 2005. It burned about 25,000 acres. This map here is showing you the predicted fire risk at the month of that fire happened, right? So August of 2005, we can use all these conditions and say, okay, based on the model that we built, what was the predicted fire risk? And so you can see it, it kind of captures it quite well. And then I'm not going to dwell too much on these, but what we can also look at is we can compare the kind of average conditions observed at that location. So these are all points with inside that area burned and look at them sort of on, the red is kind of under average conditions. And then what were those conditions at the time that the fire happened? So this kind of blue is the risk or the distribution of the predicted probability within that fire perimeter when the fire happened. And you can see we're like kind of way off up into this upper end uh, relative to average conditions. And just to give you guys a little bit of context here, um, the highest risk on this, this is an annual fire probability of like 0.4, and it, it sounds kind of low, but if you like flip that on its head, what you would expect, um, if you're of a 40% chance of a given area burning in a year, uh, you would expect a fire return interval at like a fire every two and a half years, right? So this is basically saying that like when you're up at the highest risk area, it's you're, you're expecting very frequent fires. So it's another thing that that probability allows you to do. And then you can also just break it down by how were the various predictors that we use actually contribute to this risk. And again, um, I apologize, this is kind of getting in the weeds here, but like, for example, this is interesting to look at here with the one month rainfall, actually what we can see is the blue during the time of fire was actually a little bit wetter than average conditions, right? So you're kind of in this middle to upper upper end of, the, of their rainfall. Um, and you, for the 12 month rainfall, you actually have a little bit like slightly wetter conditions. And so what we're already kind of hinting at here is some of the interesting results of this model is that sometimes this long-term rainfall, that fuels accumulation can actually drive risk more so than the drought at the time of fire. So if you have questions about this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get back into this in a little bit. Um, but what the outcome is, is pretty cool because we're using monthly rainfall and this is kind of where we're going with this essentially is to get this up to real time. And so we've got a project funded by um, the Hawaii Emergency Management Authority through FEMA. And we're trying to kind of take this monthly uh, approach and actually getting it to real time daily fire maps. But even with this monthly approach, you can kind of see based on like average rainfall here for Oahu, how fire risk changes in space over time. And so this is sort of like forthcoming, but it's just a little bit of a teaser to see like what the, uh, the utility, right, of this, of this um, kind of approach is. And the other thing we can do with this is actually look at historical conditions. So we can actually, so, okay, let's look at what the model predicts through time, like that we, over the fire history that we've observed. So this would be for about the past 20 years. And what are the frequency of kind of moderate high and very high fire risk conditions? And so there's different ways that you can kind of like define these, um, these variables, but it's kind of like from the upper end of observed fires, the risk during observed fires, to the lower end of risk during observed fires is how we kind of create these categories. And so this is kind of like a like a climatology of fire, right? You can see where and when, how frequently given areas in the state experience these high risk conditions, right? And so, you know, for Big Island, obviously you get this huge, um, you know, high, high, high fire risk all around Waikoloa and South Pohala there. And then um, South Point, which is a Thing that people have brought up all the time, the fire department is always responding to fires down there uh, under these very high risk conditions. So this is, again, it's sort of like what, what areas do we need to worry about? Where do we need to invest resources? Where are people um, really needing to uh, be concerned with as far as these pre-suppression pre actions that, that Mike was talking about? And we can do this basically anywhere in the state. So it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. And the patterns, again, like when we look at these very high risk conditions, these spots that maybe would be not so intuitive for you, um, you think about Kauai, for example, right? This zone above um, uh, above Kekaha, Waimea is this 
kind of abandoned sugarcane. It gets these large fires every few years. But for example, um, above Anahola is a really area of high, high fire activity um, that the fire department has a lot of response in. And so that also, it shows up because you're, they're smaller fires, but they're happening frequently enough to, uh, to show up in the model. Also interesting patterns for Oahu. I mean, you get this kind of band of herbaceous vegetation kind of above, uh, so that mid elevation, which starts to peak. And, you know, we've seen fires in this low elevation area through Aluhe and things like that. So it, it's interesting some of these patterns that emerge. Um, okay. This is a little bit more complicated, but that effect that Mike was talking about where you get these wet cycles and dry cycles. So it's like the long-term and short-term rainfall. This is really what I, I wanna kind of, I think the important take home of what I'm trying to talk about today is that we can observe historical patterns in rainfall variability using this strategy and understand kind of like our best and our worst case scenarios with respect to fire risk. And so what this is doing is kind of taking what happens when you have um, short term, like one to three month uh, above average rainfall versus below average rainfall combined with long term, right? So like that 12 month window of above average rainfall and below average rainfall. And so this is what this does is allows us to see kind of like when we have a long term wet cycle and a short term dry cycle, this is like our worst case scenario, right? Long term, big rains, and we accumulate all those fuels. And then we get one of those short term droughts or short term dry, dry periods. And that's kind of our worst case scenario. Whereas our best case scenario, right, is sort of like dry, dry. Like we, we're low rainfall for that longer term period. And that really is the times actually we have to worry the least about fire. And what becomes so interesting, I think, looking at it this way, as I was saying, is that we can have high fire risk conditions just due to those long-term fuels buildup, right? In other words, we can have rainfall variability like under the span of a month, which is this model's capturing, that will really uh, dramatically increase, uh, affect fire risk out in the, on the landscape if we've had these big fuel buildup periods, which we're seeing, at least in the past few years, we're seeing pretty, pretty frequently. Um, and so again, you can look at this kind of like, again, worst case scenario, best case scenario, and I think what I want to draw your attention to is the difference between these, these, these conditions, right, um, are really what it's, it's bigger <laughs> than these future changes, what I'll get into next, right? So there's huge differences on year to year, month to month variability that we have to cope with and that firefighters are responding to, right? Like, Mike's talking a lot about this pre-suppression action, but you know the bottom line is we we're not implementing enough of this uh, to to really um, I think make big dents in, in, in the fire footprint we're seeing, and all of that burden falls again to the fire responders when they're running out to to respond to these things. Um, and brings us to climate change. So, right, what are we talking about with, with climate change? How did we do this, and what are the limitations? And again, I'm not trying to say like this isn't useful. But the limitation with future climates, what we're dealing with right now is primarily that we're talking about average conditions. So what we can do when we look to the future is kind of say, okay, here's our current average annual rainfall, sort of what's your average 12 month span and your average three month span? What does that current risk look like? And then how does that risk change in the future based on average annual rainfall, right? So we can see here is basically the purple is decrease in fire risk and then the green and yellow is increase in fire risk. And that might not sound counterintuitive because everyone thinks, you know, future warming, uh, drying that we're seeing that we may, uh, that fire risk should be higher. But actually what these models are predicting is that some of these areas, again, based on average conditions, are predicted to decline in fire risk. And what that would imply is that there's not enough rainfall for vegetation to grow. Um, this is where my skepticism comes in, frankly, because what I am uh, afraid is that when we start to make these projections forward, since we're not capturing the potential for annual variability, we could still be seeing heavy rainfall events followed by short-term drought, which might not get captured when you sort of average it over the year that may, reflect kind of those historical, the historical variation that we've been seeing. Um, bottom line here is that what makes us so sensitive to these changes? Again, same thing for Maui uh, and the other islands. We can see where these tendencies are start, where we have increasing tendencies towards increasing fire risk. The, I mean, it's, it's moving up uh, in elevation 
by and large. But what's making us so sensitive to this is the grass. So in all these conditions also, I should say that the future land cover hasn't changed, right? So we're dealing with sort of our best, you know, the best measurement of, of current land cover. And it's the grasslands that make us so sensitive to this climate. So if we were to sort of, you know, run a model where we replaced all the grassland with like wall-to-wall -wall forests, for example, like these probabilities would be way less and you'd get much less sensitivity to um, the, the rainfall variability. Um, not a lot of change on Kauai predicted for the future. Uh, I think just because the drying trends there are, are uh, predicted to be slightly less than the other islands. So at any rate, I have some other slides, but I, I don't want to uh, get too carried away uh, with, with the technical aspect of this. I think again, the, the bottom line for me, um, kind of running through this and trying to interpret these results is, is that like, we need to basically deal with the observed variability that we're getting um, and really understand that that it's like the model, the science is like more sophisticated than the climate projections at this point, right? We can sort of understand how things are varying kind of in real time uh, to the degree to which that those future changes are, are become a little bit more tricky to, to predict, right? And what, what's really gonna happen. Um, so yeah, again, we can take questions. I probably flew through that. Um, take questions at the end or if there's time now, I, I don't, I'll pass it back to the facilitators. Thanks so much, Clay. Um, that's a lot of great uh, food for that. We'll stick to Q&A at the end, if that's all right, um, for, for all three speakers at the same time. Um, and I want to turn it over to Emma Ewan, who will be talking about the values at risk um, and implications for management. All right, thank you so much. Um, so I'll share my screen here. <clears throat> My presentation is a bit more um, uh, a larger view here and just talking less technically about ocular, but why we want to care about fires from a forest perspective. Okay, so going to the next slide, I wanted to um, just reiterate the importance of our forest from a watershed standpoint. There's a lot of really great science that has come out talking about how the really multi-layered canopy of a native Hawaiian forest that has you know an understory of mosses and then ferns and shrubs and then this canopy of um, of trees often covered in moss themselves is just so perfectly um, equipped at capturing rainwater and slowly infiltrating it down into the ground. And so that's that dense vegetation is really the secret to why this is such a um, almost a machine, a sponge at at collecting um, rainwater and moisture, which is so important for our um, fire preparedness. And we have um, a lot of data about how you know the the passing of the clouds across these forests is really increasing water recharge. And from a um, Traditional standpoint, the phrase "hahai no kaua i ka ulu laau" is this amazing uh, acknowledgement of that connection. I'm not taking it literally, where you know the the rain actually follows the forest, but just knowing that that connection of the forest and water supply was this um, this traditional uh, understanding is just incredible as well. So. That um, really puts in context then, as Mike had mentioned, this large scale loss of the forests and how um, largely because of fires and poached animals, uh, many of these really dense, thick rainforests became these barren um, zones that then um, there's a lot of accounts of the streams and the wells just drying up and um, a lot of damage to both the, um, you know, the source of water, but also the people that rely on those sources of water as well. And uh, back in 1903, uh, the agricultural interests at the time, a lot of sugar plantation owners and other folks that really needed that water for their um, sustenance 
he um, lobbied to create the nation's first forestry agency. And this is before, you know, forest protection and environmentalism was, you know, a, a common and well-known thing. They were just mostly really interested in preserving these forests because of the water um, and the importance of harvesting that water. Because the, in Hawaii, the connection between the forest and water was so direct and well understood, we were the first um, to to create our, our first forestry agency. So those an amazing history just in that itself. Um, and in those early 1900s, there's just incredible stories of um, setting aside a lot of our lands as forest reserves, um, getting uh, a lot of those hooved animals out of these forests. They didn't have helicopters back then and all the tools that we have. It's just amazing what they were able to do. But we continue that work today as um, because we know it's just absolutely critical for um, protecting uh, both the forest for their own sake, but also our source of water. And so we um, also, in addition to removing coach animals, do a lot of work removing some of our really bad weeds. You can see here, um, mule's foot fern. And one thing that's really apparent when you look at a lot of these invasive um, invaded forests and, and weed species is the ground cover underneath them is totally bare. And there's only that type of plant. It's not this multi-storied um, uh, canopy um, of, of various different types of, of plants. And so what that does is it means that not as much rain or not as much moisture that's passed through there is being collected, just um, less you know, surface area basically. And when it does hit the ground, instead of hitting, you know, a, a cover of mosses and ferns, it's just hitting bare ground, which then erodes and in further reduces the amount of going to the aquifer, but also really has a lot of flooding and erosion problems as well. And so you can see, you know, this is a um, USGS photo taken about 15 years ago of um, the south slope of Molokai and that incredible um, damage to the south slope. It's basically the mountain is brown and so you can see the brown washing down into the ocean as well. Um, and they actually had determined that without the vegetation, the dirt was eroding a hundred times faster than the natural erosion rates before um, hooved animals had been set loose into this land. So there's just this huge problem with um, losing vegetation from an erosion standpoint as well. There's been studies also showing how when you convert these forests to bare ground or grasses, the infiltration rates, so that's a little different than erosion because erosion is the, the, the dirt running off basically, but infiltration is how quickly does the water absorb into the ground or run off. And so it absorbs um, into the ground 15 times faster when you have a forest as opposed to bare soil. And what does that mean? It means that there's much less flooding. Um, and so, Similarly, in that South Slope of Molokai example, there's been studies that modeled how, what would happen if that um, land became, you know, converted um, even further to more bare ground and, and the, the forest that exists was converted to, to that um, more degraded state. And it showed that the flooding, the top um, peak flows would increase by about 40%. So, huge amount of water volume um, would uh, result in uh, if we further damage these, these forested areas. Just from a public health standpoint too, these hooved animals have a lot of um, impacts. Hawaii actually has the highest mortality rate, um, age-adjusted mortality rate in the entire nation for non-tuberculous mycobacterial lung disease. And we also have a lot of um, leptospirosis problems and other um, issues of fatal or 
also non-fatal diseases that these hooked animals are spreading across our communities. So reducing this erosion and reducing the um, hooked animals that are in these landscapes is really critical for many reasons. And so, um, as you mentioned, there's a lot of efforts. We um, largely use fencing to um, protect these forests. That's one of the, the ways that we are um, keeping these hooked animals out. These are for um, four-legged animals. We, um, the fences that we build still have gates and that sort of thing to allow people to access them. Um, but you can just see the stark difference of an uh, area that's fenced, like on that kind of left upper half of the, the photo versus unfenced um, and the, on the right side. So it's really a really um, effective and long-term solution. And again, we have you know, kind of a fenced, unfenced area. This one this is Libra Halika Law. So from a uh, um, statewide perspective, while we've been doing this work, it's, most of our forests are still um, unprotected. And so you can see that we've already lost you know, a majority of our uh, entire uh, landscape from being in a native state, in a native vegetated state to converted. Um, and only you know, 5% of our landscape is both fenced and um, remaining in native vegetation. So it's, it's really um, a lot of work that we need to do and quickly to make sure that every day as we speak, as we're sitting here, these forests continue to be, you know, diminished and eaten away. So it's it's a very urgent thing that we're we're working on. We um, also do a lot of invasive weed control. Uh, there's a lot of uh, I'm gonna just go a little faster here because I want to get to the fire part. Um, but you know there's a lot of data showing how these invasive weeds are so damaging for various um, reasons, largely water supply. And then um, just getting back to the other things that are really threatening our forests. Um, rapid Ohia death being one, but now you know, going into the fire um, perspective, this is a photo of um, a fire break that was successful in, south, um, in Southwest Maui by the Ma'alaya uh, area. And it's really a good indicator of how um, effective some of these tools are. It's uh, helping us control the fires. The next um, slide is just showing, again, in Southwest Maui, a fire that burned just very recently. And, um, you know, there was a burn that occurred in 2007 that went to 3,600 feet elevation, but unfortunately this fire went higher and higher to 4,300. And so that's the trend that I think, you know, Mike and, and Clay were mentioning is just the fire is eating higher and higher, unfortunately, into our remaining native forest. So what Mount Kahalavai Watershed Partnership did after this fire um, is they came up with a lot of different action items. And this is some of the things that um, need to happen to really address these fires. And, uh, you know, we had already talked about fire breaks, but also um, doing a lot more infrastructure to make sure we have trucks and water tanks and reservoirs, and then try to do more um, reforestation and reducing all that invasive grasses that are such huge fuels. Um, and then on a planning and outreach standpoint as well, that's what, you know, the wildfire management organization really helps out with, but um, you know, creating strategic plans and working groups and um, trying to to make sure that that we have um, a lot of this these things prepared when we have a future fire. Um, this is a picture of Cyanea heloensis, which is um, a 
plant that was found only in that area that was um, was burned. I believe it was spared. I'm not quite sure, but um, it's just you know it, it's trying to illustrate how these fires can really impact some of our most um, rare plant species, and you know every single one is is so damaging. Wanted to also mention an, another big climbing tool that we have is our because these are voluntary organizations that um, is that are able to work across landowner boundaries and do that sort of um, planning that we need and coordination. So about two million acres are within watershed partnerships in Hawaii, and so that's a great tool that we have because it's really efficient and. Um, and much more successful if we can just work across these boundaries. So just to um, remind folks, you know, forests and fires really should also in your mind equal our water security. These are all very um, closely related and want to thank everyone for, um, for tuning in and I'm here to answer any questions, thank you. So much, Emma. Um, such such great pictures you shared with us, and also food for thought and reminder of all the intersections with everything uh, in terms of the the forests. Um, I wanted to invite Clay if you had any um, concluding remarks um, to kind of tie together the three talks today. You know, I think it's pretty intuitive what's driving risk. I also think it's intuitive like the impacts that these things have, especially for folks working in, the, in these ecosystems. And, you know, as far as like, maybe we haven't talked about this super explicitly, but, you know, there've been fires in the past and there's fires that happen currently that impact native forests and they have resilience. You know, you, you can go and see koa coming back like carpets of it uh, after fire, but it's really the, the, the interaction with fire and weeds um, that that's hammering us and, and that's kind of leading to this this degradation and it's not also something that's sort of catastrophic where we typically see thousands of acres of native forest burn um, it tends to be more where it's like an erosion um, you know on the lower elevation islands it's usually from the bottom up kind of from these uh, again all these areas of abandoned agriculture and, and non-native grasslands and then on the larger islands, it can be kind of from both sides, from the top down and, and bottom up. And so, um, you know, they, they really, they pose this challenge, but at the same time, you know, in the context of sort of climate change and, and climate impacts, uh, you know, some of the ways that we've been trying to talk about this, especially with the work we've been doing with Pacific Fire Exchange is that, um, you know, we know what to do. I mean, Emma showed some really awesome examples of, of, of mitigation that works, right? It, it's not rocket science, um, you know, no matter how sophisticated and, and nerdy the models can be, uh, when it comes down to it, it's just, we need to get work done on the ground, um, controlling fuels. It's like the one component here that we actually have pretty uh, clear control over uh, and we can, we can change. And, th and then I think it's also recognizing that there's limits to what we can do with these grasslands as they exist. And I think a really good example, and maybe Mike wants to chime in on this, but was this Mana Road fire that happened um, in, in 2021, where, I mean, it, it ripped through really nicely grazed pasture land, right? And so, again, these grasslands, they pose like a, a lot of problems, A, because obviously it's sort of the source of weeds, and when they're adjacent to native ecosystems, they can invade those areas post-fire. Um, they're highly sensitive to climate variability, weather variability, right? Uh, they're incredibly dangerous for firefighters to fight fires in. Uh, you know, the, the, the fire behavior in these grasslands is highly erratic and moves quicker than you can imagine. Um, but they're also something that, you know, we can deal with. It's more just a question of, you know, can we commit, like as a society, to invest resources uh, in that? So, um, and there's also things we don't understand. I think there's, I keep getting stories. I think I saw Nick Agarasis on the call here. Like we're seeing native ecosystems come back in some of these areas uh, after fire and trying to understand what the heck is going on. So there's a lot of cool questions 
uh, sort of on the ecology side to, to figure out, and maybe that might have some um, help for us to respond post-fire, right, and, and the aftermath. And I think the, the best sort of, the best thing about working in it is that folks are starting to understand, I think, or not even starting to, they really understand people that are doing the conservation work on the ground. They understand that the problem is kind of beyond their immediate project so that it sort of encourages us to partner with different people. Um, and it really, uh, I think it's kind of seen more as these opportunities, right? It's not all doom and gloom, although that West Maui fire was, was pretty sad. Um, you know, it, it is a, it's, these are opportunities to sort of engage with this, with the broader public to help people understand um, the kind of threats that, that these fires pose and how it's linked to, to non-native uh, species. Thanks so much, Clay. Well, why don't we uh, invite everyone to turn your cameras on if, if you uh, are interested and can do that. And um, it's time for questions and answers for our three speakers. I'd like to give them a huge thank you for um, sharing all of that knowledge with us. Um, so who would like to go first? Uh, I have a quick question, I, but I, I think um, you turned my camera off earlier, Elliot. Um, if I don't know how to turn it back on. I'll see but, if I can do that. Yeah, but but I, so sorry, this is Flint, Flint Hughes. Um, thanks to everyone for the great uh, presentations and information. Really appreciate it. I, you guys touched on it a little bit here and there, and I, I, I wondered specifically about um, programs, kind of post-fire remediation with with native species that can tolerate fire, and really creating seed stores and seed deployment strategies to not necessarily create. Um, fire retardant systems, but but systems that can regenerate after a fire. I think of things like Ali'i and Aveo Veo and even Alima if it's not if it's not hammered by animals. Um, those kinds of things where kind of what what would be a like uh indigeneering those fire <laughs> landscapes with <laughs> with natives that can tolerate um the disturbance and not necessarily like I said not necessarily preclude fire or, or but but allow for a native system to return. I think the National Park at Ahavo is explore, maybe conducting that kind of restoration work. And I think it's very innovative and um, may get at help, helping to get at reducing some of the, even some of the um, uh, uncertainty involved in dry, wet seasons as well. So that, that was just a thought that keep, kept coming up as you all were talking. Um, and just wondering if you all had more thoughts about that as well. I mean, I could just add that, yeah, the park is definitely like not recently. I mean, this is kind of going back more than 10 years, but at the forefront of that in terms of uh, Ronda Lowe's work and the Broom Sedge fire, just kind of the bottom of the Mount Loa strip road. So, I mean, yeah, I think there's a lot of potential there uh, for doing, you know, adapting, using fire tolerant species. Um, you know, I think you also hit one of the other limitations that they found in that project is just like the seed source for these, doing these projects at scale. I think, you know, that's something where we need to kind of square the circle in that sense of our capacity to do restoration typically is kind of like an acre at a time. You know, and so we haven't, we haven't, you know, aside from Kaho Olave, you know, you can talk with um, Paul Higashino about using direct seeding and strategies like that, but that's something that we, we, we just starting to kind of explore and we still don't have the capacity. It's one of the things I'm, I'm kind of interested in, in, in really pursuing uh, yeah. is developing seed production <laughs> strategies so that we can try these things. Um, yeah, it, it's not, I mean, it's something to strive for and certainly not out of the realm of possibility if it, it's a it's a it's a will issue i think and and then pursuing funds to 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 support such an effort 
But it, yeah, I mean, when people are like, oh, well, you know, you only get 1% survival of seed scatter or something, but if you can dump out millions of seeds, like who cares, you know, it's just like rapid response and at scales that, you know, are, you can't do by hand, right? Like growing every every seedling out and putting it out there. But. Yeah, I, I mean, in the, in the fire that was off the Daniel K uh, uh, fairly recently that came out of PTA, th there's a lot of uh, elite regeneration. You can see around the road, it's ferocious. And coming back, and and that's just from natural seeding of the individuals that, that were there initially. So I that that that's kind of a hopeful example. And some of the some of the work we did a long time ago, the seasonal sub montane in Hawaii, same thing. Yeah. Initial burn, you see the shrubs really bouncing back. Um, so I, it, it seems like a a hopeful um, path to investigate. I, uh... I have a question for Clay. This is Kitty. Hi. And thank you all for really interesting uh, presentations. Uh, I don't know if it's just not intuitive to me, but you know, Clay, the historical rainfall variability, and you show the scenarios of long term dry wet and short term wet dry. So I just didn't understand. Could you explain how the wet, 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 long term, wet, short term? seems to have a higher, um, you know, both have a pretty a higher fire risk, I guess, than if I'm understanding. Yeah. Right. Uh, it was the hi the highest fire risk is a wet long term, dry short term. Yes. But even if you have a wet long term and a wet short term, fire yeah. risk can be high. OK. It's because it's the long term fuels accumulation is the best. It's just the, accumulate more accumulation yeah. and then you you get hit by something. Yeah, there's just more grass out there and it kicks yeah, our yeah. butt and, and we're not we're not managing it right effectively. And and also the the slide you showed on the future average change um in fire probability. So yeah. those were just using rainfall mean project? annual rainfall, mean annual temperature. Project? Mean annual rainfall and mean annual temperature. Okay, thank you. Hey, I uh, just wanted to chime in with that, if it's okay with everybody. Hi, this is Jack from uh, Palau. Can any, everybody hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Thanks, Jack. Uh, thanks, Elliot. Uh, well, I just, uh, I'm I, uh, thinking about how we here in Palau have sort of tried to restore our Forest, and uh, I'm sure uh, many of you have come and seen it. And some of the things that have been successful here are small scale community sort of grants, giving uh, initiatives to folks uh, to sort of get up there and plant the trees themselves, um, certain areas. Um, and this is where we've been able to sort of refine the, the needs, the refine, uh, sort of estimate the amount of. Uh, work and effort is, is required to put into something, you know, and scale that up. So we've now sort of, we're starting to implement those at a much uh, larger uh, scale. We know what the species of trees are best, uh, most fire resistant. They don't, ne don't necessarily have to be native trees. They can be just the initial sort of succession type trees. Um, but, you know, I'd, I'm sure you folks have, uh, have seen a lot more, you know, of such large scale. Um, I don't know how I would be of any use in 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 your perspective, but maybe um, you know I we can uh, sort of further this discussion on you know what's worked uh, for us and and maybe help you guys get started in, uh, in that regard. It's very community driven, um, you know, village level household level type of uh, things, but uh, that's, that's essentially what it took to get here. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a lot to learn from Palau. I think the work that you guys and like Ebil, I'm just familiar with Ebil Society and Singio, and I mean, I think, and the, that reflects a lot of where I think we've been making most progress in Hawaii. I don't know if Nani wants to talk about that a little bit, but with, in terms of like getting communities involved has been 
you know, the ones that are kind of in the most direct threat and kind of have their their homes, right, that they're they're worried about. And I also think, just add, and I kind of got, I, I cut out for a second, I lost you there, but there is a lot, I think we're at Palau's probably ahead of us as far as trying green strips and kind of trying to uh, do restoration within the savannas there as a, as a strategy. And I think that's kind of what I was hinting at when I'm talking about these grasslands, we're just like a sort of a slave to them when it comes to fire risk and and, and things like grazing and mowing, they can be effective, but they also, there's lots of conditions which they fail. And I think that, you know, altering the fuels to something that's less flammable um, is something we need to be thinking about at scale, which you guys have been doing. I know like with the Palau, the protected area network, the work they've been doing up around um, Lake Nardoc and stuff. Right, there's a lot, been a lot of um, sort of learning as we just plodding along in the dark kind of uh, things, but eventually, you know, sharing this and, and having those people with who actually know the, um, the forests and the savannas and, and the areas and what kind of, um, you know, situation uh, in terms of fire, in terms of, you know, you know things like that. So your perspective is important but i believe the community should be brought into these discussions as well for you know the hawaii the locals there the koaina and, and and folks like that thanks so much jack is there another question from the audience i have a question great talks everybody um i'm wondering if there's any sort of uh push towards like standard standardized post-fire seating something like on the mainland there's the burned area emergency response um through the forest service is there anything I'm, I'm still pretty new here so is there anything like that here or development or interest in something like that um, Go ahead. I, yeah, sure. I like. I think interest for sure. Um, the burn area response program for those that don't know it, it's pretty cool. If you're in a federal on federal lands, there's like a pot of money that's pretty much there to assess and kind of take some emergency management like actions. You know, so weed control and they do like erosion control and things like that. Um, yeah, our big problem here is resources, right? Like so. We don't have any designated funding, like there's limited federal lands, right? So we have had cases like where it's fish and wildlife land and, and they've been eligible for bear area response funding. Um, but yeah, limited limited resources to like do things after the fire, I think would be the simplest way. I, I think there is interest in it. And right now we have a landscape resilience grant. I think that's the, what's maybe Nani can correct me if that's not right, but for the Forest Service to look at hydro mulching. So this is a partnership with DOFA, Division of Forestry, Hawaii Wildfire Management Organization, and then Taylor Marsh is Nat Native Ecosystems, is a private uh, contractor, and he's been developing native seed mulch mixes. And we've done some trials post-fire at small scale. Um, yeah, grasses are really hard though to deal with, right? Like he, he yeah. It's uh, so a lot of this is done like we've kind of had some success at these smaller scales, but nothing's we haven't had the resources to deploy things large. Even in the bear area response, it's been mostly like weed control, a post fire assessment, and then weed control, strategic weed control, but not rehabilitation, right? Not like actually going in and doing large scale restoration. I'd like to follow up with a quick question for all three speakers, and that, and that's maybe starting with Clay. How certain are we in these trends continuing of fire risk increasing in elevation? And how, I guess, for the other two speakers, how how prepared are we for that, or what might we need to do to better prepare for that? I'll just say real quick that beyond kind of like what I'm explaining, that that sort of shift kind of Malka that in those future climate models, it's all still constrained kind of by grass, right? Like, so it's sort of showing like you get this, you know, hot spot, for lack of a better word, like you're kind of highest risk areas kind of in those middle elevations and where it extends up Malka 
is really still determined by the distribution of these herbaceous, these fine fuels. And so again, for what it's worth, as far as average conditions showing that shift, um, I think it's more a demonstration that there's concern and there's potential uh, for these fires to start occurring uh, and, and sort of reaching and having risk be higher at higher elevation, but that it just kind of shows how vulnerable, right? Like all of our forest resources are kind of in this ocean of grassland around it and the incentives to, to manage those and the resources to manage those. It's like, we let the plantations go out of whatever, pull out, but then there was no sort of, you know, concurrent or whatever investment in doing something else with those lands because like Mike said it really well, like you just farm houses instead. Um, and so, yeah, we, that, that's the problem we're in, right? It's, it's not like a, and it's not, it's not rocket science. And it's even like with the climate change models, what it's doing, it's kind of like anchored by this fact that we just have this really widespread distribution of, of these fine, fine, highly flammable fuels. Thanks, Clay. Other questions? Hey, this is Andy Cullison. I had a quick question. With some of those like counterintuitive, maybe to, to the layperson what Clay was talking about, where wet, <clears throat> long-term wet can actually be higher fire danger. Has there any, been any um, talk about like how to use that to how when to close areas to the public? And because um, I think, I, rem remind me if I'm incorrect, Mike, but don't we usually just use like a, like a, like that, like long-term drought to, for when we close or just wonder if other places have thought about how to close places based on like what would be actually the highest fire danger times. Uh, for the locations that we have um, remote automated weather stations, uh, you can calculate the KBDI, the Keech Byram Drought Index for that area and the foresters can use that uh, because that's a pretty common scale for fire danger. And the foresters can say, okay, you know, once KBDI gets in the 600 range, then we're gonna close this area because the danger is too high. Um, and that's, it's justifiable at that point for the foresters, but with the public, they can get, but they're always gonna get pushback on any kind of, any kind of closure, um, but, you know, things we do close things quite often for either if there's a fire in the area or a storm blows a bunch of trees down and it's not safe for the public, or you know, a culvert blows out. All those things have happened at Kula Forest Reserve uh, on Maui. So those are you, you can close areas like that. It's, um, it's you know, we don't often close things in drought periods. Um, Elliot, did did you guys ever have any closures due to drought at Puvava? Yeah, we did back in 2010. Um, uh, it was closed for a few months at least. It may have even been up to almost a year. Okay, um, I would actually I have a couple of photos to share for folks that, for Flint's comments. Uh, if you guys uh, kind of want to see what Flint was talking about. So this is that um, Aali'i in Elima. I believe there was a Veo Veo as well that was um, growing right off the side of DKI post fire. Um, uh, you can see how dense everything. Is. Can everybody see that photo? Yeah. No, that looks great. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, and Nicole. for those of who know Nick Agarastas, he's not a short man. Yeah, he's about eight feet tall. So, <laughs> so even though. Then... <laughs> He's still on the call. He always refers to himself as the runt of the family. <laughs> um, but he, wait, what is he, 6'6"? Six, six? So this is a, a dense stand here of shrubs. Um, let me see if I can move. Uh, did, the, did the photo change at all or? Maybe not. No, right. it didn't change. Just saying that 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 came back quite quickly after that burn too. Uh, pretty amazing, and it, it those those shrubs were really competing for everything, including the nutrients, uh, um, and and 
it's I wouldn't I wouldn't say that's a grass dominated system right now. No. It is it's a really small, I mean it's it is a yeah. small area relative, but it's Nick uh asked Melissa and I to take a look at it and try maybe I was thinking if we could do some drone over flights and monitor the change of that area just to see what happens going forward. We can't really, you know, it's just kind of hard to tease out whether or not it was just burned at the right time and there was enough animal grazing on the grasses that allowed the shrubs to you know sprout and it's it's there's there's a bunch of different things i don't know if you could really ever tease out as to why that happened there but it did and to to see what the persistence of that regrowth would be would be really neat to see one of, one of the things that is um, uh, interesting, with, especially with Ali, underneath the mature plants before a fire, there is just a tremendous number of seeds building up in these in these areas where you've got mature individuals, um, and so that's all. I, there may be some some survivorship going on, but. I think the vast majority of it is regeneration from seed, from that copious seed that is that was stimulated after the fire. And it makes me really wonder if it was just that area burned hotter to like knock down the rootstock of the fountain grass or whatever it was there before. Yeah, it's that's something interesting to try and figure out why and if we could actually replicate it or promote it. Um, the photo I'm showing here right now, since we are on this um, topic of seed scatter and seed spread, this is a hydro mulch spray post fire in Waianae Kai that is um, Aali'i and Uhaloa. I think there's there was some that had some Aveo Veo in them as well. And these are really small little plots that were just hand sprayed. And this is the result. I can't remember what uh, timeline that was. Um, but you can see the survivorship is really good in the plots. And you're just surrounded by seeding guinea grass right there. Um, so this is something that we're really interested in actually scaling up a bit with the helicopter. So we've got some projects that are funded, one in Waianae Kai for three acres, and then we're looking at a, a bigger one, uh, post-fire Pu'uanahulu area to uh, um, try and, and see what the success would be scaling up with the helicopter and doing it. Um, and uh, you can kind of see in this this photo right here, you can see that grass going up that ridge in the back. Uh, if we were able like to hydro seed into the, something like that in areas where we can't run machines up and that, that, that ridge right there, the fire always burns up around the fire break and burns that ridge and then burns down again into the forest reserve. Uh, if we could somehow convert that to a more shrubland composition, uh, we we could potentially have some fire behavior changes on the ridge where it could slow down and we could be able to get a hold of it quicker. But... Um, if I could just make a quick comment and then we can um, take this after the 3.30 if anyone is interested. Uh, I just wanted to um, thank our three speakers. Emma had to run. Um, Thank you so much for sharing, and um, it's great to see these these pictures of restoration and um, you know what what promises lie ahead with restoration. Um, and Nani, I don't know if you have any final thoughts, and then we'll turn off recording and then stick around for whoever else wants to stay with us. No final thoughts. It's just um, seeing all these folks and all this conversation reminds me that. This is um, stuff that's of interest to folks. And I'm just glad that we can have this and hold this space um, for all of us. So hopefully there'll be a part two.